Okay, over the next two weeks, um, I'm going to be doing a couple things. Today, you're going to be starting to look at some of these, and this is actually not the first video you look at, but I just wanted to point out to you that, um, you you know, I'm not expecting you guys to watch these entire videos, and you have to let it flush out questions for you so that I can try to address them over the next couple of weeks. Um, my advice is to go to that little gear thing and change the playback speed to 1.25 or 1.5, and, and then stop it. He This guy pauses uh, while you guys work on things things. So stop it. And uh, for some of these assignments, I'll be asking you to, you know, write stuff out and take a picture of it. Um, I'm going to start by switching over to, you know, my big overview. And I plan this week to really cover older stuff first. And then next week, we kind of circle back to the newer stuff we've been doing. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll go from there. But please email me when there's a topic that I'm trying to address people's questions. And so if you if you don't tell me you've got a problem, I, it's hard for me to help you remotely as hard enough as it is. So um, the test is two weeks from uh, today, basically. I'm making this video Monday morning. Um, so it's May 11th at 12 noon. Um, and so just a real quick sort of overview of the, what I consider sort of the first half of the of the course before we get into rotational things. Um, so position, velocity, and acceleration. So velocity is is a rate of change of position. We look at average versus instantaneous. Uh, we look at graphs. The slope of a position graph is equal to velocity. The slope of velocity is equal to acceleration. The time rate of change is the same as the DDT. So if I have a, a DDT of an X function, that gives me an instantaneous velocity function, whereas the average velocity function is just the displacement over the time it takes to occur. So quite a lot packed into there. That's That was, you know, a lot of our September, early October. Um, I've got snapshots of the AP reference table. Um, I'm going to be producing something for you guys to use. I'll go over it with a video and I'll put a PDF of it up. You should be working on, I would get some fresh paper out and start to work on um, sheets that you'll have access to when you're taking that test. Um, these equations, these are adapted versions of what I would consider the Regents equation, same thing. This is VF equals VI plus AT. This is displacement is equal to initial position plus initial velocity times time plus one half AT squared. That's our D equals VIT plus one half AT squared. And this is VF squared equals VI squared plus two AD, where this is the displacement. So those only work for constant acceleration. So I would expect on your C exam for them to, you know, make you show your calculus prowess. And uh, so I would encourage you when you start to look at this first assignment to really, you know, pay attention to this integration. We waited until people had learned integration and in calculus. So I would pay attention to that. Um, and just because I think that's more likely than just a basic sort of regions level question. Um, so moving along, uh, Newton's law. So we talked about why do things accelerate? So the, f the first law is really an object uh, tends to keep doing what it's doing if there's no net force on it. So if Newton's first law is objects will, will keep moving the way they're moving unless there's a net force on them. Second law is F net equals MA. Third law is when one thing pushes on another, the other thing pushes back on the first thing. So uh, forces occur in equal and opposite pairs. They don't ask you, and I think you know this by now, to list out these equations. F net equals MA is our, our main application equation, but you have to kind of get these ideas of inertia. Um, so there's second law, uh, force of friction. Uh, this is again off of the AP reference table. So we have kinetic versus static. Uh, you want to make sure that you're comfortable with the fact that static friction can be any value up to the maximum value, and that's what the mu s gives us. So this video isn't going to really get into depth. I'm just trying to uh, reactivate things. If you're feeling anxious as I talk about a particular topic, that means you need to dig into the uh, to the review lessons at a little bit more depth and ask me questions, and I can send you what you need. Uh, Two-dimensional issues, uh, certainly the, the forces in two dimensions. We talk about, um, you know, that an object has its weight that's acting down, and so if you have a ramp, ramp the motion is going to be this way. So we would look at figuring out the parallel component of this object's weight. Um, and that would be found by taking sine of the angle, right? 
um, because this theta that's down here is going to find itself in this triangle. If I can just real quickly make a dashed line, I can do this. Can I? I don't think so. Not too coordinated. So that's theta there in that little triangle. That's the same as that theta there. The perpendicular component of weight is found with cosine of theta and that would contribute to the normal force. So there was a whole level of intricacy to that. Uh, circuit in motion, uh, we can have a constant speed, but still be accelerating. And that's because the direction of the velocity is changing. So if I hang in a tangential arrow there, if I have an object that's located right there, moving in a circle, the velocity is this direction there, but a little bit later it's that way. And that gave rise to this equation for centripetal acceleration. This is the radial acceleration equation. So it's a little throw ahead there. Uh, the centripetal force is found by taking the mass times the centripetal acceleration. Um, we did problems where we would, you know, find normal force and things like that. So this is something to dig into. I think that's one of the harder topics of the year in terms of review. Okay, so uh, dig into that topic and let me know if you want to uh, focus on something. And this is really, this next two weeks should be, you should be selecting things that you're like, oh my God, I don't remember this. Uh, jumping ahead to uh, uh, system problems, we had the center of mass where we use this, what I consider kind of a weighted average formula for the center of mass. We talked about a system of particles that were just interacting with themselves, and that would mean that their center of mass's velocity would be constant if there was no external force, and the acceleration of the center of mass would be zero. So this was our our this topic. I think, from your perspective, it seems a little isolated. Uh, we use this to kind of jump into momentum because you can see the mv's here, and if we have a closed and isolated system, the sum of the mv's for that system stays constant. Uh, so, uh, along with that definition of momentum, we had a bunch of other stuff. The momentum equation is nice and simple, but momentum's a vector. Uh, change in momentum is the same as impulse. And let me just drag this over and cover this up here. The impulse momentum theorem was this big equation where we had a lot of different things uh, connected together. We could find impulse by taking change in momentum mass time change in velocity. If we knew the constant or average force and the time that it operated over, it was force times time. Uh, in a calculus sense, since we could have a force that could vary, uh, if we had a function in terms of time, we could take the antiderivative of that and evaluate it at the starting time at the end and ending time, um, which means that if we have a graph, we can, the area captured is equal to that. So that's the impulse momentum theorem. Uh, the other thing that came up was Newton's F net equals MA, it was, he wrote it in terms of rate of change of momentum. So if you had a momentum versus time graph, the slope of that would equal the net force. Uh, that's a little, you know, uh, that equation, I mentioned this a few times this year, where it's a very detailed equation that, that's, I think, worth, even for this test you're taking, worth knowing. Uh, so, yeah. We, uh, I didn't put a slide in for conservation of momentum too, so I'm just going to want a blank page. So conservation momentum in and of itself is, is uh, a problem. We typically, and I would expect on the AP test that you take, there's a chance that you could get like a collision where they want you to demonstrate. Uh, you know, if I was to make an AP test that was just one question, I think I would do a collision because it could, I could bring in a lot of different topics with the same question. Um, work is force times distance. It's a dot product. It's a, it produces a scalar answer. Uh, work is the, uh, when work is done, you cause a change in energy. The rate of doing work is power. So there's, this is a fairly rich topic too. And we had an integral stuff in here. This was a little confusing, I think, because it's work is the integral of force with respect to distance, whereas uh, impulse is the integral of force with respect to time. So you want to make sure that um, with all that, with everything that's been going on and everything that's sort of packed into your head over the year, that's an easy thing to kind of merge together in your brain. And you want to make sure that you're, you know, actually thinking about that for a second. Okay. Um, work energy theorem. So that's sort of like the impulse momentum theorem for work. If we do work, we cause a change in kinetic energy. We derived sort of these together. Um, kinetic energy is one half mv squared. So that's a, a, a topic. Uh, power is the rate of doing work. Uh, the average power 
versus instantaneous power. I think, you know, the one thing to try to reactivate in your head was that instantaneous power, that's a capital P, is best thought of as force at a moment times the velocity at that moment. So that will tell you the power at any particular moment. Whereas if you have work being done over a long period of time or a certain period of time, we would take that amount of work, divide it by the time it took, and get the average power, right, versus the instantaneous power. This is the instantaneous power. Okay, uh, gravitational potential energy. So, you know, one sort of good thing is we didn't end up having to cover general gravitational potential energy. Uh, sort, of, sort of sad, but sort of good in terms of, you know, not having to cover too many topics. So we assume we're near the surface of the Earth and MGH. We still covered, and, and certainly they could throw a question at you about potential energy curves, where you've got a function for potential energy. Um, and so this is worth making sure to put on your hit list and remembering what it's all about. Don't forget that the slope of the potential energy curve is equal to the negative of the force, or really this equation says it better. I think the force is equal to the negative of the slope. So right here we have negative slope on this graph. That means the force is positive. And here the slope is positive, so that means the force is negative for this object. Don't forget that we did problems where we uh, either had a function or we were given, say, an object that was released, say, right there um, at, with zero velocity. And as it went down, it lost potential energy, gained kinetic energy, so it links up with conservation of energy problems. Um, oh, a little typo in here. I think that was supposed to be an equal sign. Let me see if I can fix that. Oops, plus sign. I can type. I can type. There we go. Okay. So uh, springs. This K here is a spring constant. This is really for an ideal spring. So you want to, I think, especially where, if, if I were you, where my head would be at, would be like, I would just want life to be as simple as possible. Um, th this is a, you know, the higher level physics AP class that you're in. So we're looking at, at you to think about this in a sophisticated way. Chances are low that they're going to give you an ideal spring. They're probably going to give you a spring where they give you a, an equation. If they gave you a spring question, they would give you this. And you would want to figure out the work done by that spring by using integration with respect to x. So just be, you know, as we go through this real quick in this introductory vi video, just keep that in mind that ideal springs are unlikely, I would say, on the, this upcoming test, and they're more likely to have this unideal case where you have to go back and, and think about work in a, in a general sense um, where you're integrating with respect to distance. Okay, almost done. Um, so conservation of momentum, I brought that up. Conservation of energy, that like I said, I think that's likely. I wouldn't say it's it's likely in the sense that you can expect it, but I think in terms of, of a question, I would expect something like that. Um, and you know, keep in mind that elastic versus inelastic. This even came up recently where we had those disks that would get dropped on top of each other, and that was like an inelastic collision where some of our our energy turned into heat, but momentum is conserved. So don't forget with this sort of problem here, if you have this blob of clay that's coming in, it's going to hit this block that, you know, we use conservation of momentum initially because uh, it's a closed and isolated system, and that'll give us this initial velocity. But the kinetic energy of this clay as it comes in is not going to equal the gravitational potential energy of that at the end. There's some energy that turns into heat. So it's just, it is a little mind-numbing that the, the momentum can stay the same, but the energy doesn't, um, but there are different things. So I'm hoping that that's a good little th sort of throwback to what I consider sort of the first half of the course uh, that doesn't deal with rotation. So thanks for tuning in.